All right, I'm not here for my musical skills. Um, I took piano lessons in second grade, and I can play the guitar good enough for camp. Um, but I'm not here for like, we've had great leadership conversation and um, theological conversation. I am here today not to talk to your craft, but to speak to your heart. So take this as very pastoral, like a, just a pastoral word today. My counselor once told me about the personality profiles of clergy. Big studies have been done across the nation, across clergy, across denominations, on the personality profiles of pastors. And he said one of the interesting things is that the personality profiles of pastors are very similar to actors and politicians. Isn't that funny? You're like, why, why is that? Because at their best, actors want to touch the heart. They're artists, artists wanna make you feel something. And at their best, politicians want to bring people together and make a difference, at their best. Of course, then, like at their worst, an actor is a diva or the center of attention. At their worst, a politician can be power hungry or manipulative. And we can think about all of the worst of those things, but at their best. And my contention is that you as, uh, say, a worship director, worship leader, anyone, especially anyone who serves in the front in some capacity, my guess is that your personality profile is similar too, and that at your best, you want to touch someone's heart. You want someone out there not just to know about the gospel of Jesus, you want them to feel it and to see it. And that at your best, you want to gather people together in such a divided world, you want people gathered together before the throne and before the lamb, and at your best, you wanna make a difference. My guess is that you fit that, or parts of that personality profile as well. But we know, we know that there's also the, the shadow side of that. That if we're honest, we too um, can be prone to manipulate, uh, can be prone to, um, be self-seeking, ego and pride and self-importance for anyone who is upfront in any capacity. I think we have to be honest, there are temptations. My thesis today is this, that we all have a desire to construct an identity. Even those of us who know that our identity is grounded in Jesus Christ alone, we all have a desire to construct our own identity, uh, to, to be someone, to make something of ourselves, and that especially for those of us who are up front, it is an elegant temptation, an elegant temptation to make something of ourselves. And that you'd think of all people, I work for God, I'm, I'm a servant of Christ, and yet I'm, I'm pretty sure because I'm preaching to myself too, that if you stand up front, there's an elegant temptation. Identity, that's what I wanna talk about today. We all try to construct our own identity. We long to be someone, we don't wanna be a nobody. And so uh, we say, does anybody like me? Is anybody paying attention to me? Does anybody love me? Will anybody stay with me? And what do I have to do to be noticed? to belong, to be accepted. We're all in the identity construction, self-justification project, we have to admit. So I wanna get at this with, uh, with a quote, we talk about identity. This is from Henry Nouwen, the great Catholic spiritual writer. He says that we are often tempted to create an identity by what I do, what I have, or what others say about me. Mm. Just let that sit for a moment. He's saying, I'm tempted to construct an identity based on what I do, what I have, or what others say about me. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a diagnostic and I'm gonna peel this back piece by piece. I'm gonna start with this one. The first one, I am what I do. Uh, what does that mean? We seek 
to build an identity by our work, accomplish, succeed. Uh, Your pastor expects you 80 hours a week, produce, show some results, prove that you're, you're worth it, that you can hack it on this staff. Prove that you're valuable and you have to work and hustle and be the hero and fix and be productive and then be unique and spectacular and remarkable. There's a temptation uh, that then people will like you. If, if If I just do enough, then they'll appreciate me. Then they'll accept me. Then they'll like me. Maybe even then God will pay attention to me if I am what I do. Uh, Eugene Peterson said that we suffer from a blasphemous anxiety to do God's work for him. Um, I've suffered from that before. A blasphemous anxiety to do God's work for him. And this is particularly tempting for you because you do God's work. You work for the church. You work for Jesus. So 80 hours a week, that's fine. I'm doing it for God. And it gets all twisted up. It gets kind of wrapped up. Selfless service for God. The good intentions get wrapped up with, uh, if I just do a little bit more, then they'll notice me. Then I'll be recognized for my accomplishments. Then my resume will be a little, then I'll be on a call list and then somebody will notice me. Then I'll get to go to the church that doesn't have any problems and is perfect. (laughs) And it'll be great. It'll be great. If I am what I do, here's the problem though. If I am what I do, what happens when you can't do or when you don't do or when you're mediocre or when you fail? You know this. If I am what I do, it's just, it's a house of cards. We all have our limits and you give everything and it's never enough. If if your identity is what you do. Next one that Nowen says, uh, I am what I have. That my identity is built on what I have. So acquire, get more, work harder so that I can have more. More money, more stuff. But not just that, more travel, more foodie experiences, more expensive fashion, Uh, Preachers and sneakers, I'm not wearing my cool kicks today, but I could get that next set of kicks or that watch. Um, And I know this may seem really shallow. You're like, well, I don't don't chase after stuff. Yeah, probably not. But think about what stuff and what money does for us. Really, under under the what I have is security. That's what we want. If I just have X amount of dollars, then I'll be okay then I won't have to worry. If I just have enough, then that anxiety, that pressure will be off. If I just have enough, and, and that's, it's really a security issue. What I have, we think will give us security. If I am what I have, what happens when everything's taken away? When you have a Job experience, and all the scaffolding is knocked out from under you and it collapses and you're left naked and you have nothing, then who are you? Then where is your security? So identity based on what I have, yeah. Last one. I am what others say about me. Be popular, be respected, be admired, be influential, be known. Build a platform and a reputation. Have a really nice person uh, like Allison introduce you and try to plug your book. You know, it's great. When people say nice things about you, doesn't that feel good? Acclaim. You want people to say, wow, isn't he, he's gifted. Wow, she's really good. Did you hear that amazing organ riff that he just did, that's, I wish I could do that. If only people would say that about me. I am what others say about me, reputation, acclaim. If I am what others say about me. C.S. Lewis had once said something like, we all like to be petted, he said. We're talking about Psalm 23 and sheep. Like we all like to be petted. 
You know, like, and, and if you just do a little trick and a little, you know, a uh, rollover, your master will pet you. And it's the same with us that, boy, if I'm just really good, if I just do a really good job, if I just write the perfect song that makes everybody cry, <laughs> or preach the greatest sermon and everybody's converted, if I'm just a really influential leader, then you get, you get petted, <laughs> admired. And C.S. Lewis said, we all want to be petted. But if I am what others say about me, what happens when people speak negatively, negatively of me? Or what happens when people don't even talk about me? When I'm forgotten or not even noticed, not even talked about? If I am what others say about me, it's, that's empty too. Identity. I'm just trying to get at identity for you. That we're all trying to construct an identity deep down inside because our soul is screaming, will anybody be with me? Does anybody love me? Will anybody stay with me in the middle of the night? Am I someone or am I just a nobody? I know that sounds like really juvenile. And even as I say it, you're... I'm looking at you and I'm wondering, oh, maybe they don't really think this, but I'm pretty sure like, if you're really honest with yourself, it seems juvenile, it seems like middle school, we dealt with those issues. But I think the truth is that as we get older, we just get more, we get better at kind of subtly creating a, an identity. Uh, it's more subtle. Try to build ourselves up, to create a facade. So what I want you to do now, this is maybe takes a little bit of vulnerability. You can be as vulnerable as you want, but I want you to take 90 seconds, two minutes, with somebody next to you, maybe they're on your team, maybe it's a stranger, and just, if you would be honest, uh, as honest as you want to be, and just answer which of these three strikes you most. I am what I do, I am what I have, I am what, I, what, what others say about me. You can talk personally, or maybe if you want to just talk generally about what you see around you or people that you know, what, what they're wrestling with, just take 90 seconds, talk to a friend, which of these three strikes you most? Ready, set, go. I know that was kind of a big ask. I'd thank you for talking to each other, but maybe there's a little moment of vulnerability, but it sounded like there was some exchange going on, so thank you for that. Um, in my congregation, there are two words that are really important. Allison mentioned that, loved and sent. We've been chewing on these words for about 15 years. I'm thinking about, I always joke, I'm thinking about changing it to loved and kept because I'm tired of sending people. I just want to <laughs> keep them. Or uh, we like to send the people that we don't like. You know, like, hey, Bill, we've been talking and we think God really wants you to go over here. And... Uh, <laughs> But these words are like, I know they're really simple words, but we haven't gotten over them yet in our church. And we've just been chewing on them for a long time. And underneath it is a theological richness that we're mining in the scriptures. Why these two words are really important in our church, two-year-olds know them. You go to a two-year-old, they're like, oh yeah, I'm loved and sent. 90-year-old, same thing. The reason why they're really important is because they get to identity. And we always want our people grounded in their identity and their purpose. So my identity, who am I? My purpose, why am I? What's my purpose? Well, we just answer that really simply in two words. I'm loved by God in Jesus Christ. From that love, I'm sent by him with incredible purpose into the world. It's really simple. But it gives our people a compass so that when they are wrestling with, as we all do, with those questions of who am I? And do I have to kind of build construct an identity to make myself someone, we can always fall back and say, this is who I am, and this is why I am. So these are really important words for us. I realized early in my ministry that people weren't always asking the questions that I was trained to answer. So people do ask, like, what's the difference between Catholics and Lutherans? That comes up. But, man, people are just asking, not explicitly, but people are under the surface asking, who who am I? Um, you get, we can get into all kinds of identity politics or identity conversation. You get it. People are subtly asking or they're acting out things 
that get to their core identity. We're trying to construct an identity. So these words are really important for us. By the way, they're both passive words because your identity and your purpose are not earned, that's bestowed. So you are loved passively by God in Jesus Christ. And by the way, just to remind you, you know this, but I just want you to really know that you are loved apart from anything you can do or earn. You're loved only because of what God does. You're not loved because of anything that you have, but only because of what you've been given. Your love not, and your identity is not based on what other people say about you, but it's based on only what, what one voice says of you. A voice that says, um, beloved, my child. Uh, I'm doing really good on time. So this is totally, wasn't planning on sharing this, but I just feel really compelled to share this. Um, we lost a, a good friend and a mentor, and Mark Seneschal is my colleague, we, a mentor of ours. Jerry Coleman died a couple days ago. Um, some of you may know Jerry Coleman. He wrote the, the hymn, The Lamb. It's kind of the famous hymn of his. He was a campus pastor when I was in college, and one time, he accomplished musician, and in Minneapolis, he was at a congregation, downtown Minneapolis, and he was leading a gospel choir. It wasn't Lutheran. This was like all kinds of different gospel choirs were coming in town. And he was, lead, he was the, the director of this great festival, a gospel festival. And a few of us college kids decided to go because Pastor Coleman's going to be there and he's doing this. And I walk in and I am out of my league, kind of like I am here. You guys are awesome. And I walk in, I'm like, I can't even play the guitar. And so I walk in and I'm wearing like jeans and like a, I don't know, like a Thrivent t-shirt. I don't know. <laughs> uh, they, they didn't have Thrivent t-shirts back then, but something, you, you get it, like something like that. So I go in and I am just out of place. This lobby is full of people and um, I'm just really intimidated. Everybody's dressed up and I'm like, I made the wrong decision. I should not be here. And Jerry Coleman, and he would always do this. He saw me. He was in a, a, a circle of really important people and he walked away from them. And he comes up to me, ah, Jeffrey, gives me a big hug. And I was, I belonged. And there are certain people in your life who've done that. And that's the gospel. That's the posture of your God. Uh, and and you, you don't have to do anything to earn that. You can be wearing jeans and a thriving t-shirt. And he just goes, ah, my child, daughter, son. That's... That's loved. And from that love, we are deployed. You can't sit still with that kind of love. We're sent for really important work, which is why you're here, because you want to do really important work, and you want to get better at that. That's why you're here. But you don't do it because you're trying to build some sort of a, a persona. So you're thinking right now, okay, what, where is he going? Why is he, I came here to learn about technical skills or songwriting, and well, there's really good people that are going to teach you that. Here's why I think this identity is important for you here. Because you don't want to be a fraud. I don't want to be a fraud pastor. And you don't want to be a fraud leader. And I worry, and I have to confess this daily, when you stand up front, there's always the temptation of being a fraud, that I'm up here for an identity that I'm constructing and that I'm not grounded in my primary identity. And I'm just saying that this isn't, I'm not saying that you're, you're bad or evil, I'm just saying that this is the natural temptation. From St. Paul to King David, uh, we all wrestle with it. And you don't wanna be a fraud. Your identity is grounded first and foremost by the love of God in Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to share with you and end with three practices that help me ground my identity that keep me from being a fraud pastor. First one is this. Places of vulnerability keep me from being a fraud that ground me in my identity. So in terms of worship, we would call it confession. We do that, this vulnerable moment in worship, confession and absolution. Uh, where you see yourself, you look at yourself not as your best, but 
but you even look at the worst of you that you don't want to admit to anyone else. So we would say confession is that. It's a place of vulnerability. But for those of us who are up front and lead in any capacity, we have to go deeper than just the, the rote confession that happens in worship. We need true places of vulnerability. So on a scale of one to 10, one being like you're super guarded, 10 being I no secrets. There are people in your life that you go to level two or three with. Maybe you have friends that's level five or six. We all need a person or a few people that we go to level 10 with, and they know everything. Do you have that person or those people, that place in your life? We would also call it like a confessor, or maybe just a dearest friend, an accountability partner sometimes it's called. I have what I call my garage band. It has nothing to do with music. It's just guys in a garage drinking beer. But that's my, a place of vulnerability for me. And we have been in that space together and we have wept together as we've shared things with each other. We've wept together. Do you have a place or people of vulnerability that is so important? that go to level 10, where there are no secrets and no hiding, just 100% level 10. Because if you're, construct, if you're tempted to construct an identity based on what others say about you, and that's, that's hard, you like it when people say things. If you're tempted in that way, this is an antidote. Because if you're vulnerable 100% with a few people, you will care less and less about what other people say, because you will be grounded in the safety and security of Jesus Christ and the community of a brother or sister. Vulnerability pushes back against the identity based on what people say about me. Second practice, uh, times of Sabbath. Now, we, there could be a whole thing on Sabbath, and you've probably thought a lot about this, but you know, and I know, we work on what is normally people's Sabbath. You're on on weekends. You don't get weekends off, and that's difficult, and so we all need these times of Sabbath. You know that the word Sabbath means to stop or cease. So you need times where you stop being productive, where you stop doing and having and worrying about what people say, where you just are. That's what Sabbath is, to stop all of that. And that's difficult for those of us who, who work on a Sabbath. Uh, one thing that's helped me keep my Sabbath better is a couple of images. One is of a hummingbird. A hummingbird, the, the heartbeat of a hummingbird is like 500 beats a minute. It's ridiculous, it's crazy. They have to eat every 15 minutes to, to keep up their metabolism because they're just fluttering so fast. It's a beautiful creature. But hummingbirds in the evening go into a state called torpor. And it's kind of like, um, it's, almost like it's almost hibernation. And their heart slows down to like 40 beats a minute. And they actually often hang upside down and it's like semi-hibernation. And they have to do that in order to make it through the day when they're hyperactive. Or the lion the male lion, not the female. The, the male lion sleeps like 20 hours a day. The female lion is like working, doing stuff. The male lion sleeps 20 hours a day for the intensity of four hours of hunting. And so on my Sabbath day, which is Friday, I'm like lazy like a lion. Just be like lazy, unproductive. I really try to be as unproductive as possible because when you're unproductive, you realize that God can make the world go without me. It reminds you, I am a creature, not the creator. I can create, six days a week I can be creative. I need to have time where I am absolutely worthless and unproductive and don't accomplish anything. It takes faith to, to Sabbath, it takes faith to believe that God will take care of your job and your church and your work and your family, even when you are relatively lazy and unproductive. So if you are tempted with the, I am what I do, Sabbath is a great pushback to that, a remedy. 
to building your identity on what you do because Sabbath is not doing and resting in the work of God. Last one, practice that pushes back on identity construction. Postures of receptivity, we'll say. So I'm gonna just say uh, two words, word and, or three words, word and sacrament. Okay, when, when I say that, you're like, you gloss over. Like, yeah. It's kind of like the right answer, right? As Lutherans, word and sacrament. Or it's like the, the tag you give to make sure you're okay with a certain group of people to prove that you're Lutheran. Well, you know, word and sacrament. I may dress like an evangelical, but word and sacrament. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in, you know? Um, I just want to go a little deeper. Don't ever cliche word and sacrament. Um, there is a beauty to our theology that makes us distinct. There's, there's a reason you're here and not at, I don't know, whatever other like evangelical worship conference there, there is. There's a reason you're here. Um, the weirdest thing is happening in our church right now. You guys know Flame, the rapper? right? Okay, you know, like he became Lutheran and now he's like the, the coolest thing since sliced bread in the LCMS, and, which is awesome. The, there's been repercussions of that. This is the weirdest thing, guys. I'm just going to be honest with you. We have had, um, and Mark and Jacqueline have saw this last Sunday, we've had like flame fans coming to our church. And they don't, they're like in the hip hop culture and I can't even People were clapping earlier. I can't, I don't clap because I just can't keep time. I'm a distraction. And for some reason, they're coming to our church. Noel comes and Reuben. Reuben is like, um, he's uh, kind of like an amateur Christian rapper. And he's starting a tour this, this weekend, actually. And his wife, Noel, they have a one-year-old daughter, Nala. They came from a more reformed background. And they've just been hanging out and they're, joined, they're in our new member class. I'll see them tonight. And uh, a few weeks ago, Noel goes, could we have Nala baptized? I'm like, let's do it. And she started weeping. She's like, there is a freedom in this, that it is a gift, that we just receive it. And, and shame on me for thinking, like just taking that for granted. And I'm like, word and sacrament, you know. No. Really? So Nala gets baptized on Sunday, and I sit down and I look over at Noel, and she's holding her daughter, clutching her up to her face, and she's weeping because her daughter is included in the grace of God. And she doesn't have to do anything to prove it or earn it, that their sanctification doesn't, doesn't justify their justification, that it's just a gift. And I know you know that, but don't ever forget it or take it lightly. And so personally, we need our own places of receptivity where I don't do anything to get, but I just receive. This gets into maybe, um, again, worship, you're on a lot, so I'm not saying that you can't receive if you're on, but do you have places of receptivity where you worship and you're not on, or rhythms or routines? I see Jim Marriott talking about... Um, liturgy and habits, certainly in worship, but then also in daily life? Do you have a liturgy of receptivity where your posture is open? So we're getting into contemplative practices here, which may, that's a whole nother topic. But just to, to encourage you in that, I had a sabbatical last summer and I went off into the desert near Albuquerque, just outside of Albuquerque, uh, to a monastery, uh, Augustinian. And for a week, I lived in this community. And I will admit, I walked into that, into my sabbatical, overproducing. I was, I was constructing an identity based on what I do. Uh, I need to do it. I need to fix it. I'm the one that has to do it. I'm the senior pastor. I've got to do this. And so I walked into sabbatical um, in need of deep confession and forgiveness. And I went to this little community on the edge of Albuquerque. And I just prayed with the brothers pray the hours throughout the day in the chapel. I lived in a little hermit house and everywhere I would go, the art was speaking to me, receptivity, a statue of John the Baptist with his hands open, uh, a picture 
of uh, Jesus with his hands open. And it just spoke to me that whole week, this posture of receptivity, open hands to receive and not to produce. And so do you have places of receptivity, postures of receptivity where you receive? Uh, Reading scripture uh, in a meditative way, Luther said meditatio, not Bible study to master the text, but meditation to be mastered by the text. Do you have places where you have a posture of receptivity? If you're tempted to construct an identity based on what you have, then receptivity is the antidote because you don't, you don't have it, you receive it. That's good news for you. We're not actors. Uh, we're not politicians. We're not even primarily, first and foremost, pastors or worship leaders or church workers. First and foremost, we are the beloved of God in Jesus Christ. You are loved by God immeasurably more than you know. Proven in blood, on an execution device, to that extent, you are the beloved of God and Jesus. And from that, you are sent into the world with incredible purpose. More than you know, really important work. The church needs you right now. It's really important work. But never forget your primary identity, the beloved. Amen?